our concerns as well. We love him. We're glad he's back from New York. In Romans 16, what do you think you find in the first 15 verses? Something we sometimes forget about. But I think it's very important for Christianity not to forget about what Paul is doing here. Let me give it to you very simply. Paul is extending due credit. A lot of times people do things and we don't really give them full credit for it. Amen. Oh, in the spur of the moment, we may say thank you, and that's the end of it. But sometimes a little bit of appreciation goes a long way. And you know, it was something I've always uh, noticed in my 57 years of ministry. It's not so good when people at the back of the auditorium tell me it was a good sermon. It's when you find out that they told someone else. That's when real credit comes along. And Paul mentions some well-known people here as well as some that we don't know so well. In these 15 verses, he starts out mentioning Phoebe. Now we don't know much about her. Paul does call her a servant. And he says that she has been so valuable to him and his work that while she comes to Rome, obviously she didn't uh, reside in Rome, although she was there at the time, but he says whatever she needs, the church needs to give her for her work. He mentions Aquila and Priscilla, you ever hear of them? Now, those were ones that helped Paul when he was first starting out and they're most famous I suppose, for straightening out Apollos, another famous preacher of the time. But Paul says that to protect his life, they risk their own. And he goes through, he mentions, did you know he had three brothers that were members of the church? And a mother, he mentions them here. They were in Rome. And he mentions them and some of his relatives were members of the church before he was. And that, that I find interesting when I first read that. Paul, so, go ahead. Paul did. Paul did. He says right here in this chapter, uh, one of them I'll quote, I'm not sure right now what verse it is, but he says, Rufus and his mother and mine. Wouldn't that indicate brothers? And he mentions two other brothers, which a lot of people think were apostles. Paul seems to credit them as such. He says, they're of note among the apostles. And so sometimes we've got to be careful about uh, making sure we differentiate between the original 12 and some of the other ways that term apostle was used. But I want to bring something to your attention. Because there's a world-renowned religion, and I won't mention their name because I don't want to embarrass anybody, But they claim that in Matthew 16, Jesus declared Peter as the first pope. And that he set up offices in Rome, and that's where he ran the church from. I find it interesting that Paul greets over 30 people in Rome when he writes this letter and never once mentions Peter. Wouldn't you find that strange that someone from another nation came over to the United States and visited Washington, D.C., and they were leader of their country, and they didn't even bother to contact President Biden or his office, just totally ignored him? That's not the type of thing we do, is it? And I maintain that if Peter was really in that position, Paul would have at least acknowledged it. Now, we know they had some disagreements along the line. We know Peter thought a lot of Paul, if you read the second letter Peter wrote. But mentioning 33 members of the church at Rome and never once mentioning the head of the church, that to me tells me something. If, and that's a big if, Peter was put in so renowned of a situation, 
Don't you think Paul would have showed proper respect to him? But isn't it Paul that said he's not one whit less than any of the other apostles? So I maintain that this is uh, good evidence that Peter wasn't in such a high tone position in the church. But let's move on. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 tells us two things. And both of them have been uh, interesting the way we use them. What's the first thing Paul says in verse 16? I'm not hearing anything but mumbers behind the mask. <laughs> I keep telling you that my ears are as old as my birth certificate. So it's, he says to greet one another, how? With a holy kiss. In my lifetime, we don't do that. And I've often wondered why. Well, I've heard some explanations. One guy just looked at me and said, now, Brother Lewis, we just don't do that anymore. Let me ask you a question. Is this the only place we're commanded to do this? No. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says it again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Peter elaborates on it in 1 Peter chapter 5 when he says, greet one another with the kiss of love. Maybe that is a problem. Maybe we have so much problems in the church today, we're not greeting each other with love. But here, here, here's my problem. I'll get to you in just a second, Brother Flowers. If I'm going to hang myself, let me get the whole rope out. <laughs> now, the first thing I want you to know here is that when the Bible commands something, we can't just write it off as a custom and say, we don't do that no more. Be very careful when we take that position on anything. Some people tell me, well, we do a handshake now instead of a kiss. Well, here's a question for you. Why do we argue with the denominations that they can't change a command of God for something else? For instance, one of the biggest arguments we got against instrumental music, it's a different type of music. So we can do that with a greeting, but we can't do it with a, the music thing. That don't work either. You can't change the command of God. The ark would have sunk like a brick if Noah would have just used oak instead of gopher wood, wouldn't have it? Don't we recognize that? Nadab and Abihu would have lived a whole lot longer if they'd used the proper fire. Now I'll tell you something else about the handshake. Do you realize where the handshake came from? It came from the culture of Rome to prove when you met somebody, they didn't have a weapon to harm you in their hand. So they stuck out the right hand to show you it was empty. Just be careful, Brother Flowers. This really doesn't mean I don't have a weapon. I'm left-handed. <laughs> so you need to be watching those kind of things. But here's one for you. Paul says to greet one another in a holy way. Peter says to greet one another in a loving way. If I love Brother Minor, does he have to worry about a weapon in my hand when I approach him? No. So I think that's a real dichotomy, and I'm finding in the last couple of years something that really amuses me. We in church even went from greeting one another with a holy kiss and we went past the handshake, now I walk in here and a lot of people are throwing their fists at me. You know, I wonder, when the Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss, if God thinks a fist is the same thing. First time that happened to me, it was one of our young men here and I was kind of teasing him and we laughed about it. He came at me with his fist that way and I said, you know what used to happen 30 and 40 years ago if someone came at me with a fist that way? And he kind of laughed, well, when you grew up in the streets of L.A., it meant something different. But let me tell you, that's what I grew up with. 
You don't show me love by doubling up your fist when you see me approaching. But that's what we're doing, even in the church today. A lot of places we go. What does it mean when Paul says to greet one another with a holy kiss? What does it mean when Peter says greet one another with a kiss of love? Simply this. And it hasn't changed. When I approach Bob Crothers there, he has to know that I love him. Whatever I do, Brother Minor has to know I love him when we were parking our cars at the same time. I did something to Brother Miner's this morning, out of fun, that I wouldn't do with a lot of people. But I think we have a relationship I can get by with yelling at his kids in a jokingly way, imitating what he just said. But he knows I love him. And as we found in Romans 12, if he doesn't know, that's really my fault, not his. Now, if he doesn't want to love me back, that's his choice. But it's my responsibility to make sure he knows I love him. Now, you can hang me, Brother Flowers. <laughs> Go ahead. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It sure does. Yeah. So that's interesting. So that's something that we should be doing. And we, we need. Somewhere, you know, you know. Well, we can't enjoy everybody. Well, we also need to understand the meaning of these words. Yeah, that's interesting. Exhort doesn't mean to browbeat. No, Go ahead, sister. So are you saying that it's not an actual kiss, but it's just an expression? I think that's what's indicated, but uh, if you want to be uh, totally along with the scriptures, I would kiss you on the cheek. No. But I, I think uh, in the culture and all that, especially with COVID around here, that may not be the safest route to go anyway. I do believe that God expects us to use common sense. And it's kind of like I said in last year's lectureship, uh, I think my subject is for such a time as this, and I was talking about uh, COVID, and how my parents taught me to use common sense when I was a little kid. And I made the statement like washing my hands after I performed certain bodily functions. People started giggling and I said, I'm talking about sneezing and coughing, not what you guys are thinking about. But my mom taught me a long time ago. If I go to the restroom, if I sneeze, if I cough, if I'm going to prepare food, to wash my hands first. Matter of fact, she only reminded us once when we came out of the restroom to get back in to wash our hands. The next time she knocked us back in there. And that's just common sense. If you don't want to get certain diseases, it's like, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but they discover, you ever hear of monkey pox? That's starting to spread now. Do you know they have found that it's predominantly in homosexual males? Yep. Now let me quote something I heard a long time ago. If a person doesn't like what he's getting, it's time to stop doing whatever he's doing to get what it is, whatever he's got. And we can use that. Then there's the second part of verse 16. Anybody know what that says? The churches of Christ salute you. There's two things I want you to understand about this. That word churches here is plural. Now, Brother Walker said something in his last sermon here, or one of his recent sermons anyway, that we need to listen to. If something is stated in plurality, that means there's a singular to it. Jesus is not authorizing 1,968 different churches like we seem to think sometimes in this world. 
How many churches of Christ are there? One. Just one. And I'll tell you in a minute where we get all messed up with the denominations over this. There's only one. What does the term Church of Christ mean? No. I'm sorry, Kenny, but no. That's what we all think. Church that belongs to Christ. Bingo. The term Church of Christ is not a name of the organization. A lot of times we use that, and that's why people lump us as a denomination. It means a church belonging to Christ. I'll get in just a second, Daniel. In Matthew 16, Jesus makes a statement. He says, upon the truth of Peter's confession, he's going to establish my church. Plural or singular? That's a singular possession pronoun. He's saying it's going to be mine. And when Paul is saying the churches of Christ, he's talking about all those congregations of people that belong to Christ. Now, the government tells me we got 1,968 Christian denominations in this country. No, we don't. We don't have any Christian denominations in this country. We have one church belonging to Christ. And that's what he's, Paul is saying. Wherever the brethren meet is a church of Christ. And that means if you compare us to South Phoenix, where I go and preach sometimes, that's churches of Christ. They're both owned by Christ. And when I say my children, I'm not including everybody that's ever born on the earth. When we were raising our four children, I had enough time supporting them without thinking about everybody else's kids. When it says churches of Christ, he's saying the churches that belong to Christ. And if you look at Ephesians, chapter 4 and compare it with Ephesians chapter 1 how many churches are there doesn't he say in chapter 4 and verse 4 there is one body and doesn't he say in Ephesians 1 verses 20 through 23 there's only one church which is his body so if the church is his body and there's only one body how many churches does Christ have just one and that's what we need to understand here about Romans 16 and quit letting denominations try to use this to justify their religious beliefs. And in my Bible, the prophet Amos says, in a rhetorical question, can two walk together except they be agreed? Let me tell you how you can recognize a church belonging to Christ. Very simple way. And you all have it in your hands if you're intelligent Christians. It's the church doing what Christ has ordered us to do. And I like using that word order. Brother Minor can tell you what it meant when the captain of the ship ordered something. Did he give you an option? Not unless you wanted to go visit the crossbars or worse. So I like using that word order. Something like, well, come on, Dave, use biblical terms. He commanded. I don't know how many ships you're on or how many duty stations, but when your commanding officer commanded or ordered, isn't that synonymous terms? I remember Lieutenant Danaher when I was on the Badger. If he said something, that was law. Nothing else mattered. Came back from school one time, the chief came to me and said, you learned a lot in school? And I said, yes, I did. He said, you bring some books back with you? I said, yes, I did. He said, throw them over the side. On this ship, we do things my way. Did that end the conversation? You better believe it did. Why doesn't it end the conversation? We just go to this book, see what Jesus said, and that's the end of the question. I'm a Bible, uh, bumper sticker reader. And one bumper sticker I remember all my life, I just despise what it says. 
It says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now, you know why I despise that bumper sticker? Because it's too long. If God said it, it doesn't matter what David Lewis believes. It's settled. And the prophet told us, thy word is settled for ever in heaven. Go ahead, Daniel, you're gonna say something a minute ago? Yeah. Singular word. a daughter living here in Phoenix. Is that my child? Yeah. Now, I've got a son living in Missouri. Is that my child? So I've got children too, don't I? I've got a daughter living in California. I've got another son living in California. They're my children. Let's not even get into all the grandkids. They're my grandkids. But they're all Lewis's, aren't they? Well, I mean, some of them got the name Berlin and Flosco and other things. But basically, they're my descendants, aren't they? And that's what Jesus is saying there. Now, one of the things we need to understand is that in my thinking, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, Pretty much what God said in the Garden of Eden, Jesus says in Matthew 19, and Paul reiterates in Ephesians 5, Rose is not her own. She's not her property anymore. Do you know what he says in 1 Corinthians 7? She says her body is not hers to do with what she wants to it. Oh, there's an interesting thing for abortion to worry about. But same token, my body is actually not mine. It's hers. I belong to her. She belongs to me. And it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about it. But for the sake of time, let's go into verses 17 and 18, shall we? What is Paul dealing with in verses 17 and 18? You know, not everybody in the church acts like they are supposed to in the church. You ever hear the phrase, he's not acting like a Christian should be acting? 
That happens. Now, sometimes it's a minor thing. But I maintain minor things shouldn't be ignored either. How much leaven does it take to put into a loaf before it spreads? Not much. It can really accumulate. Paul says, if you have a brother that is unruly. Now, this word unruly means he's just causing trouble. It's not whether I have a different opinion on point of scripture than Daniel has. Can we disagree and not be unruly, Daniel? Yeah. But when it starts to affect us in a personal Christian way, now you're heading towards unruly. And when it starts to affect other members in a negative way, you're really getting unruly. And what Paul clarifies here is that unruly is not just a disagreement with my brother. It's when I'm disrupting the church over it just to get my way. Because look at what he says here. He says they're just serving their own belly. What he's saying is they're just going for their own wants, their own desires. The Brother Flowers is not gonna lead the songs I want. I just won't come anymore when Brother Flowers is leading the scene. That's unruly. That's being babyish. When I came here, Brother Flowers uh, led a lot of songs that didn't appeal to me. You know why? Because I didn't know him. One of the reasons I like Brother Daniel, he leads songs I've known since I was knee high to a grasshopper. But guess what? Now I've even been known to ask Brother Flowers to lead a song I never heard of three years ago. Because I'm learning, I'm growing. Because I'm not trying to follow my desires. And something I learned a long time ago, which we all should learn at some point in our early adulthood, and even before adulthood, that if we don't learn new things and grow, we're going to trophy and die. And we understand that in the physical realm. If I don't get the proper exercise, the medical problems I have seem to exasperate themselves. And what's going to happen if I totally ignore all exercise? Whatever problems I got, just going to get worse and worse and worse. When I first started getting the arthritis, the doctor asked me if I exercise. And I say, yeah, I try to walk so much each day. And he says, well, double it. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, we're commanded to grow. And often, we should examine ourselves to see if I'm going to grow, or am I doing the same thing that I was doing this time last year or whatever? Yeah, we, we need to be very self. Doesn't the, doesn't the Bible tell us there's something we're supposed to do before we take the Lord's Supper? Examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. Brother Thompson can help me do the right thing. But when it comes to certain things like the Lord's Supper, he does not stand as my judge on whether I can take the Lord's Supper or not. The Bible says I've got to look into myself. Now, I appreciate if Brother Matt comes to me and says, I don't think you're doing this quite right. That's great. But the Bible says there comes times I need to look into myself. And it's not just once. James tells us that if we're not going to pay attention and do what we've heard, we're like a guy looking in the mirror. And we're ignoring what we see. What does he mean when he says look in the mirror? He said examine ourselves. And if I look in the mirror while I'm shaving and I don't like that guy looking back out at me, I've got to change. Because guess what? The mirror's not going to. If I see dirt on my face and say, man, I wish that wasn't there and just ignore it, what good does that do? What solves the problem? To pick up a little rose of soap and scrub it on my face and wash it off. But when he's talking about the unruly, what does he say to do with them? To mark them. 
and do what? Avoid them. Remember the man sleeping with his father's wife there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? They thought they were doing the right thing. They're nice, charitable, they're patient, they're loving. They're just letting the man go ahead on the path to hell, isn't he? And what Paul tells him, your glorying is not good. Don't you know allowing him to do that is going to affect the rest of the body? This is why Paul tells Rome to mark those that are unruly. And if necessary, avoid them. Jesus says there's a time when you've got to treat them like the heathen, like the sinners, like the publicans. Paul tells Thessalonians that there's times to where you've got to just walk away from them. First Corinthians 5, Paul says, I'm not even there. And I've judged that man have nothing to do with him. Let me tell you what sin does real quick. <laughs> Daniel, you got some little kids. They watch you. What you're doing is not just between you and God. They're going to do a lot of things to imitate daddy. So there's your first step of influence. I remember one time I was telling Rose, those boys just irritate me so much. How could they be so dumb as to do that? And this woman's supposed to love me, be on my side of everything. She looked at me and said, oh, calm down, Dave. They're just doing what you used to do. That's kind of a sobering thought. So the first thing that love and that sin affects is my own children. But it doesn't stop there. Now it forks off in two directions. Anybody know what two they are? The first one is my children are going to influence other children. The second one, if it rubs off on the young kids in the family, what's it doing to the young children in the church? Well, that's Brother Lewis. He's a preacher. If he can do it, and it's okay. Why can't I do it? That is the one thing in 57 years of ministry that's kept me sober. It frightens me to think that somebody spiritually can make the same spiritual mistakes I make. So you know what I got to do? Work to make sure I'm not making those spiritual mistakes. I can't go to Brother Flowers or Brother Thompson or Brother Crothers and say, you know, I'm influencing this guy the wrong way. Why don't you straighten him up? What's going to straighten him up the most? Is the vice straighten up? So there's that influence. But it's not just the young ones. I've known some well-seasoned Christians that should have known better, that's gone down the pathway to perdition just because of something the preacher said from the pulpit, and that sounded good to them. Didn't matter that it's not in here. It just sounded good to them, so they take it and they run with it. And if you think I'm kidding, sometime examine how many things we actually do in the church that is there just because of tradition and not Bible. We were just talking about one of them. We call the name of the church, Church of Christ. But that's not what it's saying. Influence. That's why Paul says you've got to avoid them. In other places, it actually says, like in 1 Corinthians 5, put that man away. You know how strong Paul got there in 1 Corinthians 5? He says, deliver him to... Satan. If that's the route he's going to take and he's not going to listen to you trying to take him out, let him go. Is that a biblical principle? Yes. <laughs> Remember when we went through Romans chapter 1? How many times in Romans chapter 1 does it say God gave them up or gave them over? And I'll tell you how serious it can get. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God says if someone don't love the truth and want to follow the truth, he will help them to be condemned for eternity. Do you know what he says? 
If they want to believe a lie, I will send them a strong delusion. In other words, I'll help them go the route they want to go. Let me tell you something a lot of people don't like to hear. We serve a dangerous God. Not a danger to us. We're blessed. We're engulfed in the love of Christ as long as we want to be. When we decide, I want to go my own way, God says, okay. And you know, Jesus tells a parable pointing this out. You ever hear this story of the prodigal son? The father's supposed to be representing God, right? At least Jesus claims he is. When the young man came to his father and says, I want what's coming to me now, what did the father do? Okay, you got it. And the father go chasing him to try to make sure he comes home? No. The father waited until he was coming home before he ran to him. Which shows you something about God that I really appreciate. As a Jewish boy, I can assure you, no Jewish father would run to his son. The culture dictates his son come to the father. But God will come meet us. Isn't that beautiful? It certainly is to me who came from a Jewish background. I think that's great. And that's what Paul is saying. Sometimes you got to let him go. But now I don't want to leave with the wrong idea here. There's a proper way to deal with even avoiding them. Even if it comes down to having to disfellowship them, there's a proper way. And what's the first rule of disfellowship? Anybody know? Maybe that's why we don't disfellowship people much anymore. And some of them sure need to be. I know you've ran into some Brother Thompson that probably should have been years ago. But the problem is, we forget what the first step is. What is the first step? Love. Everything we do with a Christian brother must be done in love. And a lot of times I've seen cases where it's done in bitterness, anger, malice, revenge. None of those things is in the quotations that Jesus gives. None of them are in the authorization that Paul gives. What's the second thing we need to keep in mind? We want to bring them back to Christ. Our idea, whatever route we have to take, is to bring them back to Christ. And if we love them, that will be our foremost desire, wouldn't it? No matter what happens, I want to bring them to Christ. Then the third thing, they're not an enemy. They're a brother. And we need to realize they're still part of the family. Just because a church will disfellowship me don't mean they kick me out of God's family. I'm still a child. I may be a wayfaring child. I may be a lost child. But I'm still God's child. And if they do turn around, we've got the fourth thing. We need to restore them. That doesn't mean when somebody acknowledges I've sinned and I want to repent of it, that we sit around and wonder what they did this time. Do you know that's a real problem in some circles? We spend more time trying to figure out what exactly they did than putting our arms around and say, we love you, welcome home. But what are we supposed to be doing? Restoring them in love. But why don't we do that? I had a lady come to me one day. No, brother so-and-so, he's a new convert. Can't you tell him he doesn't have to respond to every invitation? And this kid was. Rose may remember him. Every time the invitation was given, he responded to get prayers of the church to do better as a Christian. And sometimes I had to stop him, but sometimes he'd run on his little card. I've done this, I've done that. I don't want to know that. You've sinned, you're acknowledging that sin, and you want to be restored. You know what I told this lady? 
No, I can't tell him that. He wants to do better. He recognizes he's struggling doing better. He's a new convert. He wants the prayers of the church to help him. Who am I to refuse him? And that's what Paul said. Restore him in love. And like I say, keep in mind, you're not kicking them out of the family of God. If they've had the relationship before, when you even go as far as to disfellowship and refuse to eat with them, Paul says, no, not to eat. Then they're going to miss that if you had the right relationship. I knew one case years ago that of a disfellowship in the church that got so bad the woman sued the church. And then it found out that the church disfellowshipped her because she hadn't been to services in over two years. Well, how's she going to even recognize that? By the way, what she sued them for is they printed in the local newspaper, along with some of the things they were opposed to what she was doing, and we should never do that. Then if we go on, there's something that Paul states in verses 19 and 20. And this is something we at Tonto should be striving for. What's he tell us in verses 19 and 20? Anybody see what he's telling us there? What did you say, Bob? Made known. The church in Rome had a reputation. People could see what they were doing for Christ. People could see that they were a faithful group of people to the cause. I gotta ask you sometimes, who is the one responsible for what the people see of the church here at Tonto? Is it Brother Walker? Is it Brother Dunn? Is it Brother Thompson? Brother Holloway? Our deacons? No. Who's responsible for how people judge the congregation here at Tonto? We are. It's what we do. It's the effect we have on those around us. It's whether or not people are getting their eyes open to Jesus Christ because of where I put my feet, because of where I put my hands, the things coming from my mouth. And the big one is, am I living what I'm trying to teach them? It doesn't do any good to tell the guy next door to me he may have got tired of me. He went back to North Dakota for about four or five months. But it doesn't do me to tell him, this is the way you're supposed to be, Larry. If he can see I'm not that way. That's what we got to start looking at. The reputation of the congregation is what the congregation does. It doesn't do Brother Walker any good to go out in the community and say, we're trying to do this. If the people can say, and I've had it said to me, well, I know so-and-so, they go to that church and I'm just as good as they are. Is that a Christian thing to be said about? No, they have to see a difference. And that's what happens here in Rome. Paul says your reputation is well known. People are talking about your faith. And that's one thing that bothered me two years ago when COVID first got here. We talk about 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, God did not give us a spirit of fear. And I lost count of the amount of Christians I talked to. As soon as COVID came in, they panicked and ran to the four winds. And guess what? Some of them still haven't come back. Is that the reputation we want to have? Someone that preaches we have courage with God, who said 364 times in his word, fear not. Or do we want to have a reputation of running every time something comes up? You know what Jesus said? He says, the hireling flees when danger approaches. I don't want to be a hireling of Christ. I want to be a brother of Christ doing what I can. Then we come to verse 22. I really got to rush. Someone's opening the window. Right. Verse 22 has an interesting phrase here. Who wrote the book of Romans? 
Paul did, didn't he? Then what in the world does verse 22 mean? It says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, salute you. Who was Tertius? And don't tell me, well, in the Greek, that word means third, that he's number three. Because that don't tell me who Tertius is. What's it mean, Tertius wrote it? He was Paul's amanduensis. His secretary, he wrote what Paul told him to write, that's all. He never claims inspiration. He never claims anything, but I'm writing this down. And that's what, what I think one of the meanings in Galatians is when Paul says, see what large letters I wrote in my own hand? Paul had some sort of trouble writing. I don't know what it is. And then because a bell rang, let's move to the last thoughts here in Romans. Verses 24 through 27. It tells us the beginning and end of everything we do. What's the beginning of anything we want to do? According to Romans 16, verses 24 through 27, where does it begin in my life, in my actions? It begins with God. Nothing I can do is worth doing if God's not directing it ahead of time. Does that mean I'm inspired? No. It just means I gotta listen to God. He's given me his rules. So I know where it starts. But every beginning has an ending, doesn't it? Where does Paul say it ends in verse 27? If it begins with God, where do you think it ends? With Jesus Christ. Who said that? I appreciate that. With Jesus Christ. Christ is the beginning and ending of our spiritual destiny, isn't he? And it's God that directed Christ to come to this world to give me a chance. And what does Jesus say I have to do to get to live in heaven for eternity? It says I've got to believe and abide in him. He makes it very plain in John 12. He says, my words is what's going to judge you in the last day. He says in John 8, if I abide in his word, then I shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set me free. And when we get up to that day, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15, we're told that the books are going to be opened and we're going to be judged out of those books. Not of what some well-known preacher in the church said. Not what our elders directed us. Not what I thought sounded good at the time. You know, Rose can tell you, in 47 years of marriage, some things I sounded good didn't work out so good. But what's already in the book... And that's why Paul tells the church not to go beyond what is written. And remember this, probably one of the most important things Peter ever said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou has the words of eternal life. John chapter 6 and verse 68. We need to learn these lessons from Romans 16. It's a chapter we preach from, very few people do, but it's a chapter loaded with things that can help me get to heaven. And it's loaded with things that can assist me in helping get every one of you to heaven. And we need to be paying attention to some of the stuff that we don't pay attention to very often. I hope you've learned something from our study of Romans. I think we're going in some chapters in 1 Corinthians next Wednesday. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for once again giving us the privilege and the opportunity of coming together, studying your word, and try to ascertain things from it that would help us live closer to you tomorrow than perhaps we did yesterday. And as always, Lord, I pray that I was able to step aside 
so that only your light, your word, and your love could shine through. In thy son's most holy, precious name we ask. Amen.